Reporter Dick Leonard remembers sitting next to Gein as the sanity hearing drew to a close. At that moment, he says, he caught a glimpse of the scared, sick man behind the monster. I looked at Ed, and he looked at me, and I, I could see he was, he was nervous. He, he, he was fearful. And uh, he says to me, what are they going to do to me? What are they going to do to me? So the judge raps and everybody to be quiet. And uh, I had my hand down on the bench here, and he's, uh, he's next to me. And he reaches over and grabs my hand like, uh, like uh, I was his mother or something. That afternoon, the judge ruled that Ed Gein was legally insane and therefore not competent to stand trial. He was sent off to live at Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a psychiatric hospital in central Wisconsin. For the people of Plainfield, life after Ed Gein would never be the same. We never locked our doors before this happened. Uh, but we began to lock our doors. The 50s was an era of innocence, I believe, and it's pretty much ended that. Still, there was one last piece of business for the town to attend to. On March 30th, 1958, Palm Sunday, Gein's farm and personal effects were scheduled to be auctioned off. But in the early morning hours of March 20th, residents awoke to a strange orange haze glowing a few miles out of town. There will be an auction here Palm Sunday, but this house and the personal belongings of Ed Gein will be conspicuously absent. Call it an act of God or whatever you will. The main attraction will be missing, reduced to a mass of rubble by a mysterious fire. News of the fire reached Gein himself later that morning. I went to Ed's room and I, I told him that his house had burned down. And uh, he made a gesture just as well, the exact words that he said. In the end, after a brief investigation, the cause of the blaze remained a mystery. Residents of Plainfield were just happy the place was gone. The people in Plainfield were so happy that this house burned down and this was going to go away. We weren't going to be bombarded by the media. We were not going to be having tourists come to Plainfield to see Ed Gein's horror house. The auction of Ed Gein's estate still took place as scheduled on March 30th. Gein's grisly handiwork was not up for sale. All the human remains had been shipped off to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Yet that didn't stop hundreds of curiosity seekers from descending on the farm. One of the things sold at the auction was Ed Gein's car, which a very enterprising carny type immediately purchased and started to uh, take on tour. Uh, Ed Gein's car uh, used to show up at uh, county fairs, like an exhibit, you know, like the two-headed cow or, you know, uh, the bearded person, so that uh, that would be a, an exhibit that you could put a tent around it and charge admission. At Central State Hospital, staffers soon came to view Ed Gein as something of a model patient. Ed was a quiet individual. He'd go and sit in the corner in the day room, and uh, we had some nice lounge chairs out there, and he'd read the paper there. And, uh, he wouldn't converse too much with other, other patients. I can remember we used to play cribbage together out in the day room. There were, however, times when Gein behaved oddly. When it got, say, full moon, he would talk about women, what he'd like to do to them, and just ramble on and on, just like very incoherent. And then as the uh, full moon dissipated, he would get more back to normal. But uh, he always had that glint in his eye that uh, you kind of figured there was something there that was wrong. In 1968, Gein's doctors wrote a letter to the court stating that Gein was now competent to stand trial for the murder of Bernice Warden. 
when he walked into the courtroom, there was dead silence. It was just, I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And then he, he walked in and he stopped a little bit and he bowed his head to the uh, audience. After a nine-day trial, the judge found him guilty. The 62-year-old was sent back to Central State to live out the rest of his days. In time, Ed Gein's macabre fame would fade, yet his twisted saga would never lose its capacity to shock or its power to provoke our deepest fears. By the early 1970s, an aging Ed Gein was quietly passing his days in a Wisconsin mental institution. He'd go to his room a lot and lay on the bed and uh, kind of daydream. So um, I don't know what he was thinking about. I couldn't read his mind, but we, we always had the thought that he was thinking about what he had done. Gein and his gruesome crimes had long since faded from the public consciousness. Yet the story of the so-called mad butcher of Plainfield had firmly taken root in the darkest reaches of the American psyche. It was a time where he became almost unlifelike, almost like he was a, a creature of fiction, I think. Uh, some type of a demigod, almost. My name is Gunnar Hansen. In 1973, I killed four people. I was Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When Texas Chainsaw Massacre was released, it played predominantly in drive-ins. And to say there was a, an uproar over it would be an understatement. You know, teenagers went in their cars looking for a good time. And what they were uh, exposed to was literally 90 minutes of pure hell. Directed by Toby Hooper, the film featured a character named Leatherface, who wore a mask made of human skin. During the filming, late one night, Toby told me that this was based on Ed Gein, uh, very loosely. I mean, what he said was that Ed Gein was the inspiration for the family, that if you take essentially the fact that they made furniture out of bones, that they had skin lamps, uh, that they might be cannibals, and that Leatherface wore a mask, those characteristics were lifted from Ed Gein. What Leatherface really is, is Ed Gein as a little child would imagine him to be. Because these crimes were real, we had to make Leatherface into this hulking monster who wears a mask of human flesh and wields a chainsaw. Instead of being the boy next door who, who does these horrible things. 17 years later, a different take on the legend of Ed Gein would help make the film The Silence of the Lambs a critical and commercial hit. If you look at The Silence of the Lambs, where the Buffalo Bill character is trying to make a, a skin suit out of women's body parts, which is something that's based directly on Gein. The killer, the grave robber, all of the things that, you know, you want to get into a good horror story, he was there. He was their source because the imagination could take Ed Gein anywhere, and, uh, and, it, and it has. The irony is that as twisted as Norman Bates was, as terrifying as Leatherface wielding his chainsaw is, and as pathologically insane as Buffalo Bill is, Gein was worse. Gein had everything these characters had in spades. 2001 saw the release of a low-budget independent film about the life of Ed Gein. I thought Ed Gein would be a good topic for a movie just because of the mindset of this person, uh, this, this person who lives by himself with his fantasies and with just his loneliness and his mental illness, eventually steps over the line and becomes a killer. On July 26, 1984, Ed Gein died of respiratory failure. He was 77 years old. There wasn't too much emotion at that time. There wasn't much talk going on in town other than he's gone. He's dead. 
Ed Gein ended up being buried in the most uh, appropriate place for him, right next to his mother in the Plainfield Cemetery. You know, ever since her own death in 1945, uh, it had been his, his great dream to, to get back to her, and uh, finally in death, he, he had achieved that. Sometime after his death, Ed Gein's tombstone was stolen from the ground. It was eventually recovered and is currently being kept in storage at the Washara County Sheriff's Department. To this day, however, groundskeepers at Plainfield Cemetery still find flowers and letters that have been left at his grave. There's no way in the world that anyone could ever decipher completely or even uh, intelligently what Ed was thinking or doing. It's not the nature of man to do the things that he did. It's, uh, it's, it's an aberration. The fact that Ed Gein was a sick man mentally, I don't think that mattered to any of us. He did some horrible things, no matter what his condition was, and so we had no sympathy for the man. Mr. Gein was an example of a monster that was in hiding. He was not known to his neighbors. He presented a facade of normality to them. And that's why he literally could have the mask of sanity over the whole situation until he was discovered. Obviously, we can never really know. To ask what made Ed Gein Ed Gein is ultimately as unknowable as to ask what made Mozart Mozart. You just don't know.